Thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm Bonnie Andrews. I'm head of product for Stepstone UK. Uh, we own 11 uh, leading job board brands, including Jobsite. Um, I've worked in online recruitment for scarily the past uh, 17 years. Um, and as such, I am a woman working within the STEM industry, science, technology, engineering, and maths. So first, I want to give you a story um, and tell you a true story about 26 years ago, um, an astronaut called Helen Sharman became the very first British person ever to go into space. And she was actually the first woman to land on the Mir space station. Now to do this, she beat 13,000 other hopefuls to the position after she applied for an advert. It's not the kind of advert we get on any of our job boards. And it was an advert that she, I believe she heard on the radio saying, astronaut applications, no experience necessary. Now she happened to be a chemist, so she was in the science field. Um, now, her mission really was not just a defining moment for um, British history, but for women in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths. And she became a national hero in the 90s, and she traveled the country talking about her experiences. And then she just totally disappeared from the limelight. And recently, The Guardian interviewed her because it was her 26-year anniversary of her mission into space. And they asked why she disappeared from the limelight. And she said that, yes, she wanted her, she wanted her privacy back, but also that she found herself increasingly, when she was being interviewed, and bear in mind she's a scientist, she found herself being interviewed asked, and being asked where she bought her clothes from, which is totally irrelevant to her amazing achievements to science, science and technology. And not only that, more recently, well, in 2013, the UK Space Agency basically tried to write her out of history by describing some major, or ma major Tim Peake as Britain's first official astronaut, because in December 2015, he traveled to the International Space Station. But what about Helen? She was actually the first Briton in space. And apparently, if you look into the details, it's because of the word official. She wasn't funded by the UK Space Agency. But that wasn't clear when they, when they put it that to press. So the reason I tell you this is because unless um, girls and women can see what women have done before them throughout history and how women now and throughout history have changed the world, how can we expect them to want to pursue a career in science, technology, engineering, maths? So in today's presentation, I'm going to talk to you about the state of play within STEM, within the UK and a little bit further beyond. I'm going to highlight three ways in which we can tackle it when recruiting. And finally, I'm going to end on a brief note on what we at Jobsite have done to try and tackle the challenge for within our own IT recruitment and how we're trying to recruit more women into our tech departments. Now, according to the UK Commission for Employment and Skills, 43% of STEM vacancies in the UK are hard to fill. Now, this is mainly down to um, a shortage of applicants with the required skills and experience. But the root of this growing skills gap is education, all the way from schools through to university, through to workplace training and beyond. And women currently make up just 21% of the STEM workforce in the UK. Now, there's a serious skill shortage in the UK apart, across every part of the sector, and this leads to approximately a shortfall of about 69,000 STEM recruits every year. That, in turn, it puts wages up because there's more um, competition. It means productivity is lower because time to hire is longer, and it means businesses are less flexible because they can't plan. Now, obviously, this is costing the UK billions and putting us at a very big disadvantage. And obviously, this could be even be exacerbated post-Brexit. So this year, we conducted our own research looking, to, looking into the experiences of job seekers and found that women working within STEM had very different um, expectations and experiences from their male counterparts. Now, 14% of all the people that we surveyed who worked in the STEM sector were women and 39.5% of both the men and women in that sector believed that their company didn't actively promote diversity. And we found that the women working in STEM expected to be paid less money on average salaries than their male counterparts. Would anyone like to hazard a guess how much less the women expect to get paid in these industries? Shout. 20%, I haven't got it in percentages. <laughs> Those mathematicians in, you can figure it out when I come on to the next slide. In fact, women in STEM that we surveyed expected to get paid over £7,000 less than their male counterparts. The women were expected to get paid on average £36,571 compared to the men who expected to get paid £43,678, whatever percentage that is. 
18%, so close. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but not only that, not only did the women that we surveyed say that they expected to get paid less than men, they also got lower bonuses. So on average, the women got an average of, sorry, excuse my glasses, 2,000, and men got 2,059 in bonuses, whereas women got just 1,128 pounds in bonuses. Now, we saw from the survey results that a lot of the discrepancies in salary was actually down to women lacking confidence when talking about money at work. So we saw that 39% said that they admitted they lacked confidence when they were talking about money compared to a quarter of men. 29% said they didn't want to risk damaging their relationship with their manager compared to a third of men. And 33% said they don't like talking about money um, compared to over a quarter of men. And female graduates who were leaving university acting and actively applying for STEM roles were applying for ones that paid at, on average over £1,950 less than men. Now, when we started to drill down further into a particular industry and we looked at engineering, we could see that gender stereotypes um, exist quite starkly. Now, nearly three quarters of the recruiters that we actually surveyed said engineering is still perceived as a career for men. And 61% said that gender stereotyping still exists. And the stereotyping that we saw was particularly apparent amongst the young, with 60% of 16 to 18 year olds seeing engineering as a male profession. Now, we found that women were more likely to enter the field of engineering because they wanted to improve society, but then they would leave when they felt disillusioned. And this means that currently in the UK, only 7% of all of the engineering apprenticeships are women. And now less than one in eight of our engineers in our workforce are women. Now, a huge contributing factor to this is the lack of role models. Um, and really, if we were to have more role models where women could see these role models in these kind of positions, it might persuade younger women to want to pursue these careers. However, on the positive side, we did see that nearly twice as many women as men were interested in an engineering apprenticeship. And later, I'll talk about how that can potentially be leveraged to help with the shortfall. So not only are there fewer women in STEM earning on average less money and getting less bonuses than men, they have to deal with sexism and misogyny in the workplace. And in April 2015, 200 senior Silicon Valley women working within STEM were interviewed about their experiences. And each of these women were senior women within STEM and they'd had at least 10 years of experience. But their, their experiences highlight the issues that they encounter working in what is still very much a male-dominated culture. So 88%, sorry, 84% of them said that they were told that they were too aggressive in the workplace, and half of them had been told that more than once. 88% of them had experienced clients or colleagues addressing questions that absolutely should have been directed to them, but were instead addressed to their male counterparts. 60% of the women said that they had had unwanted sexual advances. And of those, 65% of them had said that they had had those unwanted sexual advances by a superior. And then of those that actually reported it, 60% who reported the harassment said that they were disillusioned with the outcome. Now, sexism in tech is, has been in the news quite recently with um, Uber. Um, having lots of sex discrimination claims uh, recently. And in March this year, uh, an Uber manager tried to recruit uh, a, soft, a senior software engineer called Camila Taylor for a position at Uber. Now, Camila, because she'd heard of all of the, the, the discrimination charges and sexism within Uber, she responded by saying, in light of Uber's questionable business practices and sexism, I have no interest in joining. In fact, she actually said, I, and I don't know any woman that would join. Now, the response she got was shocking. It was shocking because also it was from a woman manager at Uber. And the the manager responded by saying, I understand your concern, but I just want to say that sexism is systemic in tech and other industries. But I've met some of the most inspiring people here. Now, the exchange was posted on Twitter. Camila posted it on Twitter because she was shocked. And it sparked outrage as another example of Uber failing to take responsibility for what is a, a culture that fosters sexism, misogyny and misconduct. And in fact, last, not a couple of months ago, I think it was now, the CEO of Uber, Travis Kalanick, was forced to resign by the investors because of the scandals that um, things like this are, you know, 
having problems with the bottom line of the company. So this is a very, very public lesson for companies to take sexism in the workplace really seriously. So what can we do about it? Well, one of the things, and I think it was mentioned earlier by Gary, was unconscious bias. So we should think, first of all, as recruiters, how can we, we tackle this? Now, the preconceived ideas we have or unconscious bias that we have about the roles of men and women often lead us to make um, unequal uh, um, or unfair decisions. Now, obviously, when we recruit, we all should try and hire the people who are most qualified for the job, regardless of their age, their gender, their background. But that doesn't always happen. And that doesn't always happen because of unconscious bias. But the problem with unconscious bias is it's totally natural. It's deep-rooted in our brains. It's it came with us as we evolved, it's helped us survive. But our conscious minds actually only process a fraction of the information that we are getting every single moment. And in fact, scientists believe that every moment we receive 11 million bits of information, but we only consciously process 40 bits of that, which is a staggering amount of information that we are totally unaware of that we are processing. Now, Unconsciously, we'll tend to gravitate towards people who look like us, think like us, come from similar backgrounds. And obviously, we'd all like to think that we're open and objective. But our experiences, our beliefs, our values do impact the decisions we make. And because this is done unconsciously, it can lead to the type of action that makes us be, you know, you'll see hiring teams where everybody looks the same. It's white men in white suits, and they're the same age, from the same background, they went to the same school. Now, this type of bias has also led to things like the gender pay gap, which is currently about 18% in the UK. Um, now, unconscious bias within recruitment can be triggered when we lack information. And we lack information when we're looking at a CV, because we don't have the person in front of us. And so we fill in the gaps around that person when we see their name and their background and the school they went, etc. So how do we tackle that within recruitment? So firstly, it's not about do we have biases? It's about recognizing that we do have them and figuring out what they are and training on that so that we don't use these in recruitment. It's about making recruitment truly selective and that means hiring the right person for the job based on their skills and experiences. And so things that we can do here are uh, grouping CVs and anonymizing CVs when we're giving them to the hiring manager to make a selection on who would they should take forward next. We can also look at behavioral design so here you can use software to strip out the name or gender of, of candidates on their CVs. We can also look at um, structuring interviews, so we're asking the same candidate the same questions in the same order, so it is fair and removes that gut feel in recruitment. Um, there are also things you can do when you're thinking about your ads that you put out online. Uh, there is research to show that certain words that we use to describe jobs are coded masculine or feminine. Now, research proves that certain, some, lots of women will not apply to certain roles if the words used within the job ads are more masculine coded. And if you Google gender decoder into Google, you'll find a website that enables you to put in your job advert and the output will tell you how many of the words in your advert are masculine versus feminine. And by subtly changing the words and the language you use to describe your jobs, you may increase the reach of candidates that you will attract, particularly women. And then finally, unconscious bias training, which we touched on earlier. Um, again, research has proven that if you, if you suppress unconscious bias, you'll make them more pronounced. Whereas if you talk about them and challenge them, you can do something about it. Now, sexism and misogyny can take many forms and be truly damaging for a person's morale and their health, and as we've seen with Uber, with a company's bottom line and their reputation. Now, research out of Melbourne University has shown that low-level sexism can be just as damaging as overt sexism. So the researchers at Melbourne University um, surveyed over 74,000 women, and they found that continual, repetitive, low-level sexism was just as harmful as an overt sexist event. Now, they found that the men that they were interviewing uh, also understood that it wasn't acceptable to harass a woman at work, but that they would still make sexist comments without considering the consequences. And low-level sexism, such as sexist jokes, ignoring women during meeting, talking over women during meeting, is very challenging. It's hard to tackle. 
but having a low level or, low, or zero tolerance to this type of sexism, the way in which we do to overt sexism, requires us educating people about the harmful effects. Now, as a woman in the industry, I know how hard it can be to stand up and tackle a colleague who makes a low-level sexist comment. But if I don't, I know that I will just allow it to be swept on the carpet and ignored. But it is a challenge. So really, it's about speaking up for yourself and your values about equality. It's about listening and educating your, yourself about the issues. It's about joining together with others to, ch to call out misogyny if you see it so it doesn't go unconscious. And it's about challenging or changing the, the conversation and not being a bystander if you see this kind of behaviour. So as recruiters, of which we all are, it's important to show that a zero tolerance to this type of behaviour has the power to attract talent and create a much better working environment for our clients. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the root of the growing skills gap is education from school all the way through to university and workplace training. So we asked our job seekers at what age did they know that they wanted to be an engineer? Um, and 25% said 11 to 15, and 36% said they were 16 to 18 year olds. And then we know that STEM graduates actually earn more, about 20% more than their peers. So we really do want to encourage the next generation to take the leap. And one of the ways that we can do that is through apprenticeships. Now, apprenticeship schemes are proving really successful way of nurturing new talent. And if you're an employer or work for an employer that has a pay bill of over three million pounds, from April this year, you will have had to pay into the apprenticeship levy. Now, we've already covered that more women than men are interested in um, engineering apprenticeships. So this is a great avenue to tap up STEM talent. Now, according to the Tech Partnership, the number of digital apprenticeships has increased by 21% over the last year. And the value to employers investing in these type of apprenticeships has proved its worth with level two and three apprenticeships delivering 27 pounds of economic benefit for every one pound invested. So finally, I said that I would touch on the things that at Jobsite we've been doing to try and tackle the skill shortage we have and make it more diverse workforce when we're, we're trying to recruit for our tech department and product departments. So to frame this, according to the ONS, um, women make up just 18% of the IT workforce in 2016. In Jobsite in 2015, we ha our workforce was 13% of females. And this year, it increased to 20%. So how did we do that? Well, we started, and we did start doing and promoting unconscious bias training amongst our hiring managers and our recruitment team. Secondly, we wanted to widen our reach by, we engaged with our local university to expand our reach to, to women working and studying within tech at the local university. And thirdly, we, would, we have a role model within our business um, who is championing uh, diversity and trying to encourage women to talk about the issues that they faced when they were trying to recruit into our tech talent. So for us it's very much about talking about the issues, talking to the women within our department, asking them what they think are the issues and then raising those to the relevant people within our organisation. Thank you very much. <laughs>